I'm Jim Collison and live from the Gallup Studios here in Omaha, Nebraska. This is Gallup's Called the Coach, recorded on March 10th, 2020. Call the Coaches, a resource for those who want to help others discover and use their strengths. We have Gallup experts and independent strengths coaches share tactics, insights, and strategies to help coaches maximize the talent of individuals, teams, and organizations around the world. If you're listening live, love to have you join us in our chat room. There's a link uh, right above there off our live page. It'll take you to a YouTube page in the chat room. Is there a log in and let us know where you're listening from. If you have any questions after the fact, we'd love to get an email from you, coaching at gallup.com. Don't forget, if you're on YouTube, subscribe. You'll get a notification whenever we go live or we publish a new video. If you're uh, listening to us as a podcast or you want to listen to it as a podcast, all the cool kids are doing it these days, you can find us on any podcast player. Just search Gallup Webcasts. And Linga Felter is our host today and is a learning solutions consultant with us here at Gallup. And it's always great to have you on Call the Coach. Welcome back. Thanks, Jim. It's great to be here. My guest today is Andrea Gonzalez. And Andrea is a Gallup certified strengths coach, of course. And she's also a success coach in the business faculty at Torrens University here in Australia. Andrea uses Clifton Strengths as a tool in introductory subjects across the Bachelor of Business programs. Over the last three years, Andrea has coached over 2,000 students individually, in workshops, on campus, and on online across the globe. Each is on their own epic journey of self-discovery and career exploration. Andrea has coached students and individuals from millennials and school leavers to those in career transitions. She has a background in higher education and she has expertise in developing workshops, programs, and activities to develop student self-awareness, engagement, and employability using Clifton Strengths. She's no stranger to the value of coaching for performance. She's married to a two-time Olympian and a former pro baseball player, Paul Gonzalez. And when she's, Andrea says when she's not coaching students, she tackles her other job as team leader of a frat house <laughs> full of teenage boys at home. <laughs> That's a fantastic uh, resume as far as I'm concerned, Andrea. Welcome to Call to Coach. T start off by telling us and telling the audience your top five. Hello, Jim. Hello, Anne, and welcome to everybody. Um, yeah, that was quite an intro. It sounds better when it's said out loud. <laughs> um, yeah, so my top five, or can I say my top six, are uh, uh, learner, achiever, command, activator, connectedness, and number six is positivity. Yeah. And why do you like to have that number six in there? Yeah, that's that's um, you know that was a bit of a leading thing, wasn't it? I love my positivity, um, and the reason I bring it up is that when I first did Gallup, which was part of the pilot that ran here at uh, Laureate, which Torrens University Australia, but even before I became a coach, I only had access to my top five, and my top five when when matrix across the domains, I have one in each one, so it was I had two in influencing, but one, one in everything else, and so it wasn't really much of a giveaway and. For me, I knew there was something missing because people kept asking me, where do you get your energy from? And it doesn't matter if you've had a massive day and you might say to us, you know, around the work desk, I'm exhausted. And the next student would come up to me and I just found something to be able to give to them. I was like, I don't know. I don't know where it comes from. So when we opened up all 34 and I was able to see hiding there just behind connectedness at number five was positivity at number six. I went, there you are. That's what it is. It's that thing. You could just pull it out and just, it's my generator. Yeah. When I just need something else to, to give a student at the end of the day, I can find it in positivity. Yeah, I love it. That's fantastic. And 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 we talk a lot about the importance of six, seven, eight, nine, and ten. And 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 it is really um, for some folks, I find that it even kind of derails, you know, their acceptance of the assessment because they know that there's something missing. And then when they've just had the top five, then they take that extra, um, you know, the more in-depth report, and they say, oh, there it is. Now I understand, and and it makes sense. So that's fantastic to understand about you. Um, so as we begin the show today, Andrea, if you don't mind giving the audience a bit of context about Torrens University um, and, and your role there. Absolutely. So Torrens University Australia is the youngest university in Australia, which is really exciting. So we, we still are, call ourselves that we're in a startup phase, which is just such a, uh, a 
exciting pioneering place to be and we have a, a phenomenal team a phenomenal leadership team who are, are willing to embrace um, such new ideas and new ways of, of learning and teaching and and integrating ideas um, particularly across online so we have a lot of online students as well and uh, I have been with the university I'm in my 11th year I've been with the university for 10 years but previously I was in the design faculty as a senior learning facilitator and also as a program manager and um, I guess it, it was almost by universal design I became a coach because um, just over four years ago or just a, over three years ago, sorry, we had uh, an opportunity to move into a different role. And the Dean of Business, um, who I had been working with on my master's program, um, basically said to me, I'd love you to join the business faculty as a success coach. So that's how I ended up in the, in the business faculty um, just over three years ago. And, uh, you know, when I think back on it, I think I'd always use coaching as a lecturer. I think a lot of lecturers and academics don't realise that, you know, coaching is sometimes what we do. And if it comes naturally to you, you incorporate it into what you, you do in the classroom. But, you know, becoming a coach just opened up a whole new world for me. And then, of course, as soon as we were redeployed into those positions in the beginning of 2017, the first thing we did was, um, was learn Gallup. And, and open up our 34 and that was a phenomenal opportunity for me to have a tool that opened up a whole new world for me of coaching students. Yeah, it's interesting because, um, Jim, I don't know if you remember, but three years ago, um, I interviewed two folks from Laureate, uh, um, um, Jock, Jock Boyd and Jack Iveson. There you go. There's the show. And that would have been in um, 2017, June of 2017, I guess. Um, I and, think 16. I think 2016. Oh, 16, 16. Yeah, June of yeah, 2016. Right. I guess that's right. And it would have been um, right when this Strengths Initiative pilot was being kicked off um, at then Laureate. Um, and it was really, it was very interesting because these two guys on the screen were, you know, they had gotten Gallup certified and 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 they, they thought that this, this was a tool that could be used with this whole idea of success coaches. And and so they came on and, and for those who are watching this show um, today, you, you might want to go back in, into the archives and watch this other show because it's interesting to see um, what happened before the show with um, Jack and Jock. Oh, and there's me without blonde hair. Um, <laughs> Jack, Jack and Jock, Jack and Jock were all about um, you know, the, the presenting the big strategy, the strategic approach behind all of this, um, and 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 the why behind it, and and you know, the early days of proving this as a pilot. So very interesting uh, show for sure. But one of the reasons I was excited about getting you, Andrea, on today's show is what you're going to bring today is really what it's like at the coalface what it's like um, down at the granular level with the students, um, side by side with the lecturers, um, how are you bringing things in um, to impact the life and success of every student that comes through Torrens? And what I'd love to understand is to really unpack that in, in, in great detail, because there'll be a lot of folks who will tune into this show who are gonna wanna understand um, how you, how you do it, how you find capacity and space and time in a higher education schedule to bring something like this in. So um, that's what we're going to be talking about today. I think it would be brilliant if we could start off by talking about um, success coaches. You know, what what is a success coach from the Torrens perspective? Yeah, absolutely. So we have um, 30 plus success coaches across our verticals of hospitality, um, health and education, design and business. I hope I haven't forget, forgotten anybody there. And uh, the success coach role um, has probably four key strategic pillars, uh, being in careers and employability, uh, which is a critical uh, uh, point when it comes to looking at tertiary education and outcomes for students upon graduation. So we're looking at employability and employability skills. Uh, we're also looking, of course, at, at retention. Uh, also, our students that um, may be deemed at risk and how we can support those. That's both our international students and our domestic students. And then, of course, uh, motivation and inspiring for performance, which is also something that's important um, when you're looking at a lot of the students are here in transition. They're either transitioning from secondary 
into tertiary or they're transitioning careers and uh, looking at how they can change the dial for themselves in terms of their own career path. Um, often we have to look at what's motivating them, what's inspiring them, and also how we can uh, help them and support them with performance. So really the, the role of the, the success coach uh, is student facing, it's 100% student facing. And uh, we all have cohorts that align with our program directors. So we have support of the directors of, of various programs. In my instance, I work with undergraduate students students in Bachelor of Business, and that's across a number of streams. Uh, we have sports management, event management, marketing, uh, comms and PR, it's straight business, and a new one where we've just had our first students graduating from the Bachelor of Business and Entrepreneurship. So, And we also have a brand new program in uh, business information systems. So I work with students uh, on the Brisbane campus and online uh, around the world who are taking uh, these particular courses and undergraduate okay. programs. And so it sounds like um, undergrads. So a lot of these, I assume, would be um, school leavers who've just, you know, this is their first experience and exposure to higher education. And then in and then there'd be a mix in there, I'm assuming, of career changers as well. I don't know if you have a sense of, you know, from your experience, when you're coaching folks, do you, is it 50-50 split? Is it, you know, do you have any sense? Um, I would say, I would say it's about, for me, an undergrad, about 70-30 or 75-25. Yeah. Um, often what happens is, uh, when I have a, a student who is transitioning, they will they, they just want to put their toe in. So they'll say, I'm just going to do a diploma of marketing and I'm just going to see if that's something I really want to, want to do. I'm going to sort of try before I buy a whole bachelor. So they'll right. do a diploma with us and, and I'm really there to support them uh, with their own self-discovery around whether this is what where they want to go. Um, they might have a very successful role in, um, I've had a student had a very successful role in sales, really successful, but found that they were continually being uh, looked over for promotion and were wondering why, but because they're so brilliant at what they're doing, but not fulfilled. And so looking to, to go into another area where they they can sense uh, more fulfillment and enjoyment at work. And of course, Gallup is a perfect tool for working yeah. with that and working with that student. And so often I, when I see my uh, students who are in career transition, they will be probably starting with a diploma, which is eight subjects. Um, and then they can choose to pathway into a bachelor from that if they wanna do more. Okay, so whether I'm coming in as a, a career transitioner or a brand new um, to, to higher ed student, um, I show up uh, on day one, whether it's online or whether it's on ground, and I'm told I have a success coach here in Brisbane. Um, Take it from there. Explain to us um, from the very beginning, you know, what a success coach is, how available are you to me as a student, um, in what ways are you available, what kinds of things can you help me with, you know, take it away. <laughs> So what I would normally be doing is uh, the all the coaches reach out to their cohort and invite them to uh, have an appointment with them. Uh, then and so that would be really a face to face option. Uh, and then when I say face to face, it's not necessarily in person. So I have students I've worked with for a number of years who I've met, never met in person. And the same with lecturers, it's all by Zoom. Uh, of my cohort, 70% uh, of my students are online. So, uh, you know, so we have, I can do a one-on-one -on -one with them. Uh, and also uh, a lot of it is workshops. And that's actually the bit that really excites me is in the business, uh, in the Bachelor of Business, in, in particularly in undergrad programs, uh, we have two introductory subjects, which are core subjects, which mean regardless what you're studying, you have to take these subjects. And one of them is the subject is called Understanding People and Organisations. And in that subject, the students actually take Gallup's Drink Finder and the survey and will uh, discover their top five talents and they actually write a critical self-reflection on that. And it's actually one of their assessments. Very interesting. Yeah, it really is. And that subject um, is, is, is fantastic because it is really about introductory employability skills. It's very much about self-discovery and also understanding 
uh, and having a self-awareness of where you currently are with your employability skills. So it's a real introduction. It can be a little tricky for our high school students because not a lot of them have had tremendous experience at work. And so we, we work with that. In that particular subject I just mentioned, which is a core subject, they do, uh, a, it's really a journey for them of, of, of self-understanding and self-awareness because they'll do an emotional intelligence quiz, they'll do their Gallup Strength Finder, and then they'll also do our own Laureate Professional Assessment, which looks at in, employability skills. Uh, but the reason that the Gallup Strength Finder tool has been so impactful for me, particularly when it starts right from the beginning, when I meet them roughly about uh, you know, week week three or four, we, we really start introducing ourselves as success coaches to the students, is that it's a great foundation uh, and it really does set the stage for any other interaction I have with that student and a touch point I have with them for the rest of their course and their bachelor because if they're having a wobbly uh, or if, you know, we, we need to uh, really refine career directions and goals, uh, we, we can keep referring back to talents. And we use that as a great, great uh, tool to, you know, have some common ground and get get right again. Yeah, it's great. I remember um, with Jack and Jock in the pilot, them talking about on in the online space, how a lot of times people in the online environment will just kind of, they'll join the the class or whatever it is, but they'll, but they'll just be quiet. They won't, they won't contribute. They'll just sort of sit there and watch, you know, and once they brought strengths into the conversation and they threw that out there to the whole class and said, you know, here's the top five and let's talk about it. And I think they had some funny things that they did in the orientation process, like taking bad selfies and taking the assessment and showing your your top five with your bad selfies, that people who would not, who would normally just stay quiet were actually engaging because they had this common language that they could talk about. And it, it pulled them into an interaction and a conversation. Um, in a way that that they would have just continued to hold back had they not had that ability to do that and and so that it starts like that you know it it it, it helps um, we talk about relational shorthand and accelerating the relationship and and the understanding of one another um when you use strength so certainly you can see how that would that would happen um and it sounds like your you're seeing now as you go through this and through the the life cycle of the student that they're able to refer to that all the way through their time at Torrens um, with the challenges that they have and and um, and their ongoing conversation. So, so if I'm understanding you correctly, this this sort of initial workshop that they have in in, in week three or four, I mean, you can be talking about goal setting and motivation, or study and career planning, academic progression, subject selection. Um, you know, preparation for internships, all of those things are sorts of, are those subjects that you would talk about in those workshops? Is that right? Well, when we have an initial workshop around uh, a Gallup strength with the students, there, and, and I, I, I want to, um, I want to confirm and, and reiterate something that you mentioned, which was really powerful, is that they do light up in these workshops we have online. And whenever I hear somebody say, or a student, or somebody else say online is hard, I go, it's really not. It's not. You just need to find what your secret source is to make it engaging for the students. And um, and I know you and I have talked about this previously, is that we have a funny thing that happens where we might do the first workshop and we may find uh, in that first touch point during the trimester that we'll have some students attend, but a lot of students will say, oh, I'll watch the recording. But when they see how much fun we have, in the session and how engaging everybody is and they're contributing, we, we have a sellout the next time we all go live in a workshop because they all want to join in and they all want to share, right? So they really appreciate that. But there's something else that happens and that is um, because we, we thought long and hard and very deliberately about how we set this up in terms of bringing it into the academic space. And I, I wanna talk about that for a moment because this is really important. Um, I know you have talked about my background in professional sports with my husband, and I believe that now uh, it's almost it's almost imperative that we we engage our students not just um, in the in their learning experience in terms of knowledge, but also in the experience itself and the feeling of it. And that's where coach comes in. And for me, if I look at the the model of um, sports and professional sports, all teams have both a manager and a coach. 
right, for high performance. And for me, that's critical. So we set it up very carefully with our academics on the team in, in um, the, the business um faculty in the business program and I have a really a close connected working relationship with all of those lecturers and they're as much a part of the success my success as is you know the, the program and what we've developed and and the students who've come on board and have engaged with it because the the lecturers too I um I believe we have what in the workshops we have co-facilitation it's really a dialogue um I coach the lecturers beforehand they've all done their gallop they've all done their laureate we have a great laugh about all of this and we coach and uh so it's important to me that when we approach a workshop in the academic space, that the we're demonstrating good employability skills to the students. We're demonstrating working well together. We're demonstrating that you can be a team, regardless of whether we're not co-located. Because a lot of the lecturers that I work with in workshops, um, I've never met in person. They're in Sydney, they're in, in Melbourne and other places around the world. And I end up working with these uh, lecturers very closely in these subjects and the students sense that connection and they also sense that it becomes more of a, a dialogue and an integrative workshop. I had one student say to me afterwards, he said, I thought I was going to a lecture and I ended up going to a full-on workshop. This is brilliant. So the co-facilitation is really important to me and that the, the, the students sense that there is a dynamic that to make a great high-performing team in any class that you may have is, a, is like a high performing team that we have a manager a coach and a student the roles are very well defined uh, the, the the lecturer is the subject matter expert and they're the knowledge and the coach is really there to sense make with it. and we're really about sense making with a student and to uh, help support them with their own self-discovery in connecting emotionally um, and to build emotional intelligence around the concepts they're learning from a lecturer yeah, I love that. I love that idea. And and I know when we were talking in the um, pre-show um, prep, we were uh, you used you said it in a beautiful way. You talked about mindset versus heart set, and I thought that was so well put. So talking about you know in that that partnership that you have with the lecturers, they are informing the students um, the curriculum needs, the, the 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 information that they need to get from from the session, but you are helping them with overcome any obstacles that they have in, in being able to um, understand that information and do what they need to do to um, show accountability for learning that information. So getting the, you know, responding to tests or papers or what have you. Um, but, I, you know, so I think that's that's fantastic. I, it's interesting because I had no idea that that the success coaches in any of the verticals were actually partnering with lectures. I didn't realize that you were there during the classes as well. And and it makes perfect sense because, um, you know, I, I, perhaps because you were a lecturer previously, um, you maybe have a comfort level with that that partnership that other, others might not have if they weren't um, a lecturer? I'm, and maybe I'm wrong about that. Would, 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 do you think that's true? I've thought a lot about this and I think it's a combination of things. I think it is, some of it is definitely that I, I have confidence as a lecturer um, and being a lecturer previously. I believe that it's also has to do with the combination of my talents. I believe that my talent combination, and, and funnily enough, I went back through my Strengths Insight report in detail prior in preparation for today. And I think when I look at it now, I can see that um, there, on a number of levels, and particularly if you look at my connectedness and even in, in Activator, I, I, I have that measure of comfort and ability of like to draw people together, to find in diversity, commonality and, and common ground. Um, so I enjoy doing that and I can do that quite well in the online space. Um, I, think, I think the other thing is that, um, and this is really important, I think that I'm also very comfortable as a coach. And what it means is I don't need the, the I, I am most rewarded when those I'm coaching are successful and feel fulfilled. And so what that means for me is the lecturer feels no sense of competition from me. All right. So there's no, well, I'm not, we're not vying for, for uh, who's, 
they're they're the apex, right? In this in the food chain in the classroom. Um, I I love my favorite moment if ever watching the tennis, right? If you're watching it an open, is the moment where after the the, the 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 champion has won and they scramble up into the stands and hug their coach right and that's all the coach ever needs yeah <laughs> they don't need the trophy they just need that hug like we did it right so for me um the lecturers sense that they i i'm very clear with them um that and again as you know if you look at any if you look at the, the body language in any great photo on the sidelines of a European football game where you've got the manager and the coaches all working together, it's a really synchronistic uh, dynamic. They're very supportive of each other. They're very clear about roles and they're not in competition because what's most important is what's happening on the field, right? What's most important is that the students are successful. So what's most important is that students don't just learn something, but they also are growing and evolving and, and, and developing and and for me, the most reward for me is that they end up having confidence and courage to take this out into a career and a life that they can be really happy and proud of. Yeah, excellent. And talk a little bit about um, some of the uh, uh, trophy moments for students that you've worked with, some of these moments where they've they've won the, the, the big game. Um, and... Yeah, if you don't mind, just um, sharing a few of those stories would be great. They're, they're my, you know that's my favourite part, right? <laughs> so, look, um, for me, some of them uh, I don't see coming. And uh, I know you and I have talked about this, particularly in this role, particularly working with school leavers, and I, I live with them as well, uh, it's you have to be able to improvise. Right, because they they they're very uh, they're very interesting in the moment beings, our millennials and our our new and our new school leavers. So often it's the random things, and they're things like I online you, you never know what's going to happen. So I've I've coached a um, a sports management student, and I was like going, you know, student, where are you? And they said, well, the only place I can get that's quiet is a janitor's closet at the stadium. Right, so we're here it is, it's a janitor's closet, and there's brooms and cleaning materials and buckets and everything, and we're in this little closet coaching together. And what I thought was even funnier was that we were interrupted twice, right? And I said, what's going on? He said, oh, I'm not the only one who knows about this space. It's one of the only places with a, with a, with a closed door. So, you know, you have to accommodate some really interesting um, places with the students. Another time, same thing with, with some of my uh, sports management students. I actually uh, do coach students that are, are our AFL um, hopefuls. So we have a B2B relationship here with Torrance University Australia with Simon Black Academy, which is our Australian Football League. And so all of those students who are training and studying are also in my cohort. Uh, and I had one time where I was all prepared to have a one-on-one -on -one with a student and when I asked him to turn the camera on there's seven faces looking at me through the camera <laughs> <laughs> what is this? so very quickly I've gone from okay thinking I'm coaching one-on-one -on -one, to in a heartbeat I'm coaching a workshop of seven and I'm like trying to keep seven people engaged around one one laptop and I said what are you all doing here and they said oh we all want to talk to you so you know those sort of things happen um, but in terms of success some of my you know, it's really the students who turn most around. A student who first comes to me because they're they're a little lost, um, they're not sure, and that can happen. You know, when you get into the middle of a degree and the euphoria of starting something really exciting that can change your life has sort of worn off, and you can't see the light at the tunnel yet, and you're in the middle of it, that's a that's that's where it's just a slog, and that's where coaches really come in to to remind them of why you started. Right and what where and where you can go, and when those students turn around and I see them graduate and walk across that stage, um, and then I and they they keep in touch with me and they tell me that they're now in graduate programs in Canberra, um, others are now public speaking and 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 are being invited to uh, attend events as public speakers. I have um, a, a very a student who's still with us in um, in final trimester, and somebody who has command and command is a really is a really interesting. Uh, talent and we we unpacked it a lot and discovered that he needed an audience for his command and so as soon as because it, it you know it, it was just trying to be motivated again as soon as we found audiences for him and an opportunity for him to speak and and be in front of people he just 
came alive. Uh, so that's where we, we can start to see where we're uh, using their, their talents and in using them in ways for employability even prior to graduating can, can help them establish not just employability skills, but cement that they're going on the right track for where they want to go after they're finished. Yeah. Do you, in addition to the the stories that you know, that you experience, the anecdotal stories and the the, the messages that you get from your your former coaches that, you know, or, or just the, I mean, you shared some of the photos with me of you at graduation with, you know, your students and all that. And you can tell, you know, that there's just a really great connection there. Um, in addition to those sort of feelings as facts, what sort of measurement or facts does um, Torrens look at in order to see whether or not the success program is working? Really good question. And, uh, you know, and as you know, I'm very much at the granular level. I'm one of 12 success coaches in the business faculty. Um, for us, I think it's really a measure of uh, employability. So that's graduate employability rates, uh, those who have been able to secure a job and the time frame in which they've been able to secure, secure a job. Uh, I work very closely with our final year students on internships uh, and all Bachelor of Business students are required to do a 200 hour internship uh, to graduate. And that's a, a very powerful measure of, um, you know, seeing the, um, the rate at which those students are able to secure a meaningful internship. Uh, the other thing too, of course, is always going to be, um, you know, some programs have higher attrition than others. And when we can move the dial on those programs and those students are staying and they're staying and, com and completing, that's another measure um, of our success. Um, you know, and those things I think uh, are very important in a program like this, uh, particularly you know as a as where we are um, where we are a small but very um, you know very empowered group of of workers at Torrens, and we're really fortunate, particularly in the business um, business faculty or the business vertical, to have the support of our dean who is himself um, an accredited coach. So because the leadership sees the value of coaching, uh, I think that very much so they're prepared to see the outcomes as both the subjective outcomes as well as, uh, you know, the, the key measures of, of um, yeah, and the numbers, I think, of, yeah. of our success. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. Excellent, excellent. So talk about the internship program. When when students come to you and they say, you know, it, um, I'm, I'm trying to embark on getting an internship, um, you know, how, how does a success coach help in that environment? Hmm. So we will definitely be working with them on uh, their resumes, cover letters, interview prep, all of those sort of things. Um, and we will also be looking at, for some students, it's tricky because they they don't have um, the work experience behind them, and that can really um, it can it can handicap their their confidence. It can make them um, you know a, a little a little you know there can be some self doubt, and that's where tools like Gallup um, have become very powerful because there's nothing better, regardless of whether we're using it as a measure of um, you know of of whether or not to decide on uh, which applicant to choose. For a student that hasn't got a lot of work experience and a lot of life experience yet, when you're asked a question in a job interview, such as, can you tell us what your strengths are? Being able to talk about Gallup is, is actually really important. They don't have much yet that they can go on, right? And so we, we often work with supporting them with this. And what I'm often doing is finding a way when we're looking at internships to support students with messaging their talents their way. So it's one thing for us to be able to introduce these tools to them and for them to start using them and thinking of them uh, not just as something they think of randomly, but something I know you and I were talking about this yesterday, which, which excites me is when I start to see students using self-reflection, self-coaching, self-discovery, self-awareness, um, journaling. When I see students doing these things regularly, I know we're making a difference because they're going, that's a key employability skill now. It's about you know learning and self-development is actually one of the laureate professional assessment competencies. So when our students start to do this regularly for themselves, uh, they're 
their opportunities for professional development are exponential. So they grow much quicker. Um, the other thing I love, um, I'm a little bit of a follower of Ray Dalio who talks about radical transparency and radical truth. And I very much uh, spend time with these students uh, in, in, encouraging and promoting them to be radically transparent with themselves because that's where radical growth comes from. So when we do this, the students need to find a way to communicate and message their talents their way. So it's not my words or, or you know, the, the, the words that they that will come out of their reports, which is a great starting place. But I like to call it, when we talk about, uh, you know, name it, claim it and aim it, I like to call it frame it. So they have to find a way to uh, frame it up their way to be able to then be confidently speak about this to um, when they're in a, in a job interview uh, and, and to their supervisors at work. Yeah, excellent. Um, and I know one of the other areas, a lot of my higher education clients, I, I, and even those that are not my clients, but that I've spoken to, you know, there's this movement now for undergraduates to develop soft skill competencies. So it's not just about um, the knowledge um, that they're learning and the skills that they're learning whilst they're in university, but it's also about being able to effectively collaborate and communicate and be, um, you know, innovate and, you know, all of those, those, those different, you know, soft skills. Um, and I see strengths being brought in um, in that environment um, or as something that could be used. And it sounds like like that's something that you're doing as well um, as a success coach. Is that right? It is. Yeah. So we, we use the the tools, uh, you know, Gallup tools very much. We have our own laureate professional assessment. Um, which looks at five key competencies. There are many, but uh, Torrens University Australia selected five to use. And, uh, and I always have trouble remembering all, all of them, but it's like learning and self-development, working well with others, achieving objectives. Um, and then I know somebody else will tell me later what the other two are. Don't have them written down at the moment. Yeah, but no. That's okay. But what, we, what often happens is that, uh, and this goes back to also the dynamic in, in the classroom, is that I think the first thing we can do at the tertiary level, if we are wanting to, uh, to teach students uh, soft employability skills, is we need to model them. And that's really important. So between the academics and the coaches and when also the other touch points for students around campus is they start to see what good employability skills looks like. And so I think also in our very much our, our global interconnected world, and we've a look at, um, you know, the online space particularly, demonstrating that I can work well with my colleagues, that I can troubleshoot, um, managing conflict. That was another one of the competencies. So just managing uh, those challenges at work. If we can do that together, that's the first thing by observing us doing this, the students very quickly can, can see that it can work. Um, I have a, a lovely story I can share with you where this came about in terms of employability skills where I had a, a lecturer approach me because we had a team of um, a, a group assignment um, for some final trimester students who were really struggling. And it's hard enough to do group assignments at the tertiary level, let alone to do group assignments online, right? Uh, but it's not hard if you set it up well and you prepare and plan first. And Gallup is brilliant for that. So when they approach me, uh, and I would say this is my biggest challenge, and that's that's another point to make as, as a coach, is time. Because often I don't hear about it, that there's something that needs to be troubleshoot until it's really critical, time critical. And we had a situation where the, the lecturer approached me and said, look, we've got this, this team of three students. Um, they're, they're not co-located. They're online in different cities. And they need to pass this subject to graduate. And I'm really worried. That they're not that's not going to work uh so and i said okay how long have i got and this was on monday and she said well their first assignment is due on sunday night so i've got a week okay so basically two out of three of the students had already done gallop and another student i approached and asked her if she would be um which if she would be open to taking gallop and then we'd have a chat about it um, what's brilliant is, again, these students have are used to self-reflection. They're also used to uh, being very collaborative. And uh, also, they were self-aware enough to know they were in trouble. And so 
that's the best place you can come to coaching because they're open and ready for it. They know they need some help, right? So they're, they're primed. And so basically I knew, okay, I've got an hour. What I did was I realized if I only got an hour live with them on Zoom together, um, the work has to be done by me beforehand. So I did a lot of preparation to make that hour online with those students count. And of course, um, you know, approaching it like coaching any good team, I started with their manager, which is their lecturer, had a great meeting with the lecturer unpacked it, what was happening. Um, the lecturer was across everything. I also have the ability as uh, an academic coach to impersonate students in their online learning platform. So I can go in there and I can see the interaction between the students in this group and I can see what's happening. Then what I did was I matrixed the students across their domains so that we have a, a wonderful look at where their talents are, are sitting across the four, four domains. Uh, and then of their top five, because all students see their top five, and and then um, I invited the lecturer to also attend the live session. So in that time, the students uh, really came alive for us. I started the session by saying, and we've got an hour. It's Thursday night. You've got an assignment due on Sunday. We could spend an hour talking about what's wrong. I said, and we'll still be here talking about what's wrong an hour later. And I said, so let's talk about what's working. Let's talk about what's right. Let's talk about how amazing and awesome and talented you are and how you can work together and get something out by Sunday. And they came to the party. They were brilliant students. I was so impressed with them. What was most impressive was that they started to demonstrate employability skills by the way they started to communicate to each other during that session and communicate with their leader, who was their lecturer. And uh, if the funny thing was, is at the end of that session, I thought, Okay, we'll, we'll see how that goes, if that made a difference. And somebody asked me later in the trimester, how did that group go? And I said, you know what? I said, I got so busy, I forgot to ask. So I emailed the lecturer and said, how did, how did that group go? And she said, not only did they pass the subject, they got a grade higher than I thought they would. She said, they really impressed me. It just worked mm. well. So coaching for teams is something else and troubleshooting and particularly in group assignments or when there's group work, uh, Gallup is again, a phenomenal tool for that. You know, I, I love that story, but I, I think one of the things that's that that is equally um, um, poignant is that the lecturer came to you for your help. Um, you guys are truly partnering um, with this class, and I don't know if that's the way all the success coaches work within with their lectures within the the program, but. Um, it seems to me that that would be so very key to the success, not only because you're modeling the behaviors that you're trying to show and teach the students to have um, in your ability to collaborate, um, but just the, 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 the fact that you, you know, I would think it would be a win-win for everyone. And, and, you know, I know that in, in, um, you know, academia, whether it's K to 12 or whether it's higher education, you have very limited time, a very set curriculum um, and, you know, resources, time, money, all of those things are, are tight. Um, so I would imagine if you were approaching a lecturer who doesn't know anything about a success coach, they might say, well, you know, I don't have enough time to cover the curriculum that I have. I can't share my, my time with, with a success coach too. So how have you been able to make that work? Um, because it sounds like it's, it is definitely working in your instance. I think, I think it's a really good question, Anne. And I think there's a couple of, uh, answers. The first is that you need, uh, project sponsor and, and project leader, uh, support. So because the subject coordinator, um, and again, our dean support this involvement, uh, it means that all, all the lecturers know that their, their subject coordinators and their program directors also encourage this. Uh, the second thing I think is trust. I do, um, and I'm perhaps again, this is my combination of my top five. Um, I, I do spend some time building trust with the lecturer and also being very clear around our role and responsibilities. Yeah. So I basically spend some time with the lecturer beforehand, building that trust. And that also starts with them seeing um, that I uh, working with the, their top five and they seeing the value of coaching. And that's, that's important. I think another thing that's kind of funny is, um, you know, and you and I have spoken about this. So we we have uh, we're on an open uh, 
campus. And as you know, students can come up to us at any time. So there are no walls. The academics are not segregated from the students at all. I spend time sitting in the cafe. Students will come up to me at any time. We have a, It's a very much uh, Torrens University Australia prides itself very much on being very intimate space for students. We have small class sizes. We have boutique classrooms, boutique lecturers, and the students really appreciate that. The, the thing that happens, and what's really fun for me is because remember, I have online students, and although I might have a headset on, often I'm coaching around a hot desk with many professors and academics sitting around me and and often what will happen is I'll finish a session with a student and I'll take my headset off and the lecturer sitting next to me will go thank you so much for that I really needed that today you've just really made my day with that you know like I said what do I say and I'm like going well I just you know I just that I call it ambient coaching right? So they just pick up on these things because I'm around them. And what it allowed them to do was to very subtly see the value of coaching, right? It's not something that we, we've had to push on them. I have basically performed and worked hard and they have just observed and witnessed it. And, and from that, then they know to ask me if they need help. Yeah. And then they would with the students. So that's how we've kind of grown and developed it over the last three years. Well, and Jim, I'll jump in here real quick. I know you must have a, a question or something, but I, I think that the, the beauty to that is you can see that if, if they didn't know, if you had not had a, a conversation with those lecturers, if they didn't know what the strengths language was, it could be a divisive thing, right? Where they feel like, I don't know what the value is of this instrument or it being talked about, you know, with my students and taking the time. Um, but because you've brought them in and it is a team approach, um, it sounds like it's working really well and that the, the lecturers are benefiting from it as well as the students. Well, um, you, you know, I was just going to say, you know, I told you the other day, my favorite thing is when we have an odd number in a classroom. Right. So when I have an, I just go, yes, it's an odd number today because an odd number means that I need the lecturer to pair up with somebody. Right, and when the and I and, I, and the, the lecturers are amazing, and I haven't had a lecturer yet who has said no. When I go, right, we've got an odd number. We need to pair off. You're going to do some work in 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 teams or in pairs, and I will always say to the lecturer, "Would you mind pairing off?" And I, rather than making three, I'll pair them off. And the lecturer yeah. always goes, "Absolutely, love to." Yeah. And yeah. so the lecturer is again very intimately involved. They're growing their own relationship and trust with the class this way and with the students in their class. The students are seeing that they're doing the work and um, and the lecturers love it and say to me afterwards, I've got so much out of today. This is fantastic. And the students are developing trust and relationship and intimacy with the lecturer and the coach at the same time. Love it. Jim, what have you got? Oh, can't hear you, Jim. Sorry, forgot to mute. Unmute myself. Um, <laughs> which doesn't happen very often. Uh, she asked, uh, who initiated the partnership between the lecturers and the success coaches? That You may have answered that already, but Andrea, who initiated that, that relationship? So are we talking about in curriculum or are we talking about just overall in general? Uh, I think overall in general. Her question was, who initiated the partnership between the lecturers and the success coaches? So... I believe the partnership between lecturers and success coaches really came about when we had the first core subject where uh, Gallup Strength Finder became written into the, uh, the accessible components. And from there, lecturers started to ask me if I would also workshop in subsequent um, subjects for them. So that that's it started there. But prior to that, uh, it, we what happened is the success coaches now sit in the faculties. So we are not uh, we don't sit in customer experience or student services. We actually sit with academics and we sit in the academic space and we work with the academics and um, spend a lot, a lot of time with them. And again, I think the culture is an intimate one which then means that uh, I can't avoid the lecturers. You know, we sit with them and, we, you know, we have water cooler conversations and, and perhaps, again, my combination of, of my talents and um, also the type of, of lecturers that we have in these undergrad subjects is it's just a great, it's a great combination. It really is. Mm -hmm. for... It sounds to me like you guys played to the strengths of what you had from an organizational standpoint as well. So you knew it was an intimate setting. You knew you were going to have these kinds of opportunities. And so you began to kind of create and work with systems that you knew naturally worked in the process and would work well. Try not to force that 
square peg into a round hole, um, so to speak. So um, that sounds to me, that sounds like what's working for you guys. Holly also asks, what strategy do you, do you use to get students to engage in your workshops? Sounds like word of mouth has helped, but how, how else do you, you know, how, what did you do to get it started? So, yeah, that's a really good question too. So my background is design. So um, there are a couple of things we do. The first is that I will do flyers. And those di digital flyers with live links and everything will be announced. Now, I um, I approach each of the lecturers that I work with and ask them, can I share space in your online classroom? And they go, absolutely. I said, do you mind if I post announcements? Not at all. Do you mind if I communicate with your students in the same space you are as their coach? Like I was talking about the team dynamic, right? So, and then they say, not at all. Please do. We love it. Thank you. And so I will do colourful digital flyers. The other thing that we'll do is, which is, is which is really quite powerful, is that we will create ten-minute podcasts. Uh, between the lecturer and I on a question that the the students, which which recurs constantly for the students. So if they have a question, it could be about Gallup, it could be about LPA, it could be about anything that 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 hints on self reflection and self development. And the lecturer will approach me. It started a couple of trimesters ago, where a lecturer approached me, uh, an amazing woman, and said. Um, you know, this question keeps coming up again and again. And I said, well, there's no point in us answering it again and again. How about we do this? How about you and I DJ style, a quick podcast? And we discovered over time that 10 minutes, four questions. So two and a half minutes for each question. And we do quick 10 minutes. Uh, 10 minutes is about the most that a student can listen to on the train or the bus or when they're commuting from somewhere. And uh, so, and one was sense making. Uh, oh, I know what the question was. Originally it was, well, how does Gallup see what, what's a weakness? You know, the students have to, it's, when it's a good question, right, for students when they first start out because they're so used to systems that talk about weaknesses, right, and working on weaknesses. And now they come to a university go, you're already enough, you're fully talented, you're fully loaded, and we want to really develop this. This is a bit we want to focus on. So they, they need to get their head around a little bit. So the funny thing was we did this podcast on this. And we just did it to help the students. And this become a format that we use a lot now, right? So remember, a dialogue is always more interesting than a monologue. We know this in this format. So instead of the lecturer just sitting there saying something, now we, we back and forth, have this kind of conversation. So what was funny was that we did this. And then the next trimester, uh, another lecturer said to me, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, the, the students are, are referencing, like in their actual, you know, when they're, doing, they're referencing your podcast. I'm going, what are you talking about? And I noticed it's over the over time, over two trimesters, our podcast turned into essential resources. <laughs> of course. <laughs> and we're like, hey, how did this happen? So clearly there's real benefit to this. And 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 in terms of answering that question a little bit long-windedly, but engaging, you, we need to engage with these students the way they operate and think, which is quick and fast. And it also needs to be conversational. Um, that's really important and colourful. So all of those sort of things. Ah, uh, that podcasting stuff. I, I don't know how you. I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't spend any time doing it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, very, very effective though. And like again, you guys have played to the strengths of the students. Realizing a ten-minute segment is about what you're going to get to listen to, being very um, concise with that, and getting them knowing how many questions you can get, and then giving it to them in a way that they'll consume. And how often do you do? How often is the ten-minute podcast recorded? We do it, so this is, that's a very good question. There's no point in doing something where there's no need. And that's the other thing that I've learned. I've got a 19 year old and for this, this demographic, um, you, and this is something I learned from my husband. The two things I learned from pro sport and, and high, high performance Olympic sport is this, you have to read the game, right? Reading the game is so important. So it's very different. Professional sport is very different to club sport. It's very different to to Olympic tournament, right, where every moment counts. So just take a moment to read the game you're in and, and observe the students and then play their game, right? So there's no point in basically saying this is our process, this is the structure, this is a procedure if the students aren't on board with that at all. So and I, I am very clear with this. And I say this to all my students, even design and across business as well, it's very important to learn all the rules because we talk now about innovation and disruption and change makers and all the rest of it, right, in all of these students. 
but you need to know the rules before you know can learn how, and figure out how to break them, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. That's really important, which is why knowledge and learning is so valuable. So I encourage your students, yes, I said, this subject is a hard slog. It is, but you have to do this. If you want to make a difference, if you want to make an impact in the world, you've got to learn all these rules first and the principles and everything, and then, then you've got what you need to play the game and break the ones you want to break. It's awesome. And I love, you know, you think about, um, we see this, don't we, Jim, in facilitation um, when when Gallup is facilitating courses and things. Sometimes you can have two facilitators that are up, up, up in front. And some people in the in the audience will relate to one of them more than the other. And they'll hear the message from one that they don't hear from the other. So, you know, you're not coming across as an academic lecturer. You're coming across, you know, you're telling it from a, 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 a high performance sports perspective or what have you. You know, you're bringing a different sort of perspective on it that maybe for others, will, for some students will really resonate. And I know that we're running out of time. Um, so I, I, but I have to just say one last thing, and this is the, the Gallup data geek in me coming out, but you know, what's very cool, Andrea is, um, anybody who's ever seen the Clifton Strengths for Students book that has um, uh, the, the first part of the, the book is about the big six and the big six experience are the, the data points that we know from studying thousands and thousands of alumni when they've graduated from university, those who self-report that they're thriving in their work and in their personal lives after university. And we were able to go back and look at the common um, behaviors or experiences that those who were thriving later in life experienced whilst they were in higher education. And the things that you've talked about today hit the nail on the head with those big six, because it talks about having someone who cares about them, who values them, who wants to understand their hopes and dreams that's a success coach. It talks about giving those students experiential opportunities where they can um, work on programs and, and apply their strengths. That's the internships and the other work experience things that you guys are doing at Torrens. So almost without even uh, knowing, it's like you're you're following this script for high performance later on. So um, just had to put that out there and, and say, well done. Um, as we close now, is there anything that I should have asked that I didn't, anything that you think is important to mention before we say um, goodbye? No, I, I think we've, we've covered it all. I think my, my favourite point and the one that if anybody is really looking to, you know, to develop a similar model is really that idea of, um, you know, if you want to make significant change and we need to, now more than ever, we need to really ch- cha- make significant change in the way we educate and the way that we support the next generation of workers. Um, we need to fully engage their heart set as well as their mindset, and that's the difference. That's where I think you have you can see a wonderful combination and phenomenal radical collaboration between the academic, the subject matter expert, the lecturer, and the success coach. I think that's that is a balanced education for a student. Excellent. And, and and I have to say, Jim <laughs> and Andrea, after um, sharing an hour with you guys remotely, I'm feeling better and better about how life will continue on post coronavirus. <laughs> because we, if if we can't be doing face to face sessions, then at least there are ways that we can um, we can engage folks, um, uh, you know, remotely like this. So thanks again, Andrea, for being a guest today and sharing your knowledge and experience um, with uh, the Call to Coach audience. And 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 um, Jim, back over to you. Yeah, thanks, Andrea. Thanks again. People have been asking me, you know, we might have to make big changes in remote working and stuff. And I'm like, I've done it for eight years. Yeah. I mean, we, <laughs> this is how I do my job. And uh, and great to connect with both of you uh, across the world and to hear these great stories. And so for a temporary time, we may be forced to do more of this. And uh, but uh, I just appreciate the storytelling that we did. So Andrea, thanks for coming on. You guys, hang tight for me for just one second. We'll remind everyone to take full advantages of all the resources we have available. We have a bunch of them now uh, on the new Gallup Access platform. So just go to gallup.com slash Clifton Strengths. Uh, on that page is tons of resources. Uh, allows you to log into Access from there and really go right to your Strengths dashboard. So those are available for you. Again, Clifton or again, gallup.com slash Clifton Strengths uh, gets you right to that spot. While you're there, sign up for the Clifton Strengths uh, newsletter. We do a monthly newsletter now, kind of 
keep you involved in everything that's going on and up to date, everything that's happening in the strengths community. If you've got any questions on anything, uh, maybe this sparks some interest, send us an email, coaching at gallup.com. If you're interested in any of our courses, and Anne, do you guys have anything? <laughs> this is <laughs> maybe <laughs> at this point, do you guys have anything going on um, there yeah. in Australia? Yeah, absolutely. We do. Um, we have a, well, we've got a, a, a certification course in May um, and we've got one in New Zealand in March um, and uh, and some different ones. I, I, to be honest with you, yeah. probably it's best to check the, check the, the website. Um, yeah, and the, for website. the best, the best place to go courses.gallup.com to see what's going on uh, now with those. We, we too have begun to ask questions about how do we do these things virtually? So uh, super cool to have those. Again, I've been doing it for eight years. We not that I'm not that I'm saying anything. So go if you're interested in joining us live. So you're like, oh, I'm gonna have I'm gonna be working from home uh, more, and I've got time on my hands. Love to have you join us on these live webcasts. You can learn and you can learn from home. Pretty awesome. Head out to our Eventbrite page. Go to gallup.eventbrite.com. Register there. Follow us. You'll get uh, notifications whenever I publish anything new. That's out, and that way you know you can join us there. Join us in our Facebook group, facebook.com slash group slash call to coach. Join us. If you're not a Facebooker, join us on LinkedIn. Uh, seems like you're either one or the other. Search for Gallup Trained Coaches on LinkedIn, and uh, you don't have to be Gallup or you don't have to be trained. We'll let you in if you want to talk strengths in that, and uh, we'd love to have you do that there. I want to thank you for joining us tonight or today, wherever you're at in the world. With that, we'll say goodbye, everybody. <laughs>